Uh, okay, hello. Um, uh, today we'll talk about two architects, Massimo Scolari and Zaha Hadid. Uh, Massimo Scolari was born um, on the 31st of um, March, and Zaha Hadid died seven years ago on the same day, March 31st. Let's begin with Massimo Scolari. Uh, Massimo Scolari, uh, born, as you can see, March 31st, is an Italian architect, painter, and designer. Uh, Scolari graduated in architecture in Milan in 1969. In 1973, he became a professor of history of architecture at Palermo and of drawing at the Instituto Universitario de Arquitectura, the University of Architecture in Venice the only uh, um, architecture uh, university in Italy, the one in Venice, with that beautiful entrance uh, gates um, designed by Carlo Scarpa. Between 1975 and 1993, um, he was visiting professor at various universities, including Cornell University, Cooper Union in New York City, the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in New York, Technische Universität in Vienna, Harvard University, and University of Cambridge. From 2006, he was a Dave, Davenport visiting professor at the Yale School of Architecture. He's the editor of Controspazio, Casabella, Lotus International, and is director of Eidos, Eidos, 1989-1995, and a series of architectural books by Franco Angeli. From 1989, he designed furniture for Italian design company Giorgetti, where he was also the art uh, director until 2001. Scolari is known for his drawings, which, according to a review of his 1980 exhibition in New York City, takes the form of a critique of architecture which calls to mind the surrealism of Salvador Dali and Yves Tongui. Pyramids and ziggurats, dams and forts, axonometric forms are used to create a new architectural, surprise, surprise, e-logic. Not logic, but e-logic. And I personally think we need more of it. He has held exhibitions in Europe, Japan, Russia, and the United States. His works are in the permanent collections at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the German Architecture Museum in Frankfurt, and Centre Georges Pompidou in Paris. Uh, this is the man. He's uh, 80 years old today. Happy birthday to you, sir. Uh, today I tried to send him a message on his website, but for some reason uh, it was not delivered. Uh, I kept uh, pushing on the button, button send, and it was not sent. Anyway, I'm making a presentation about, uh, about uh, some of his works. Massimo Scolari, another picture of him. I only found uh, these two pictures. I mean, there are others, but uh, anyway, some drawings. In fact, uh, I show mainly drawings with only one exception. Well, two exceptions. The second one being a, a large uh, model. His drawings are indeed uh, those that, um, that made a, a name for him. The drawings of uh, Massimo Scolari, drawings which the so-called pragmatic schools of architecture would hate. Would hate because they are indeed uh, uh, unengaged with reality. They are uh, dreamlike, uh, they are, they are uh, idealistic, there are the meditations perhaps on, 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 on life and the afterlife, that is life and death, they are about memory, they are about dreaming, and we don't dream any longer, or very few of us. This is a book um, published by Skira, The Representation of Architecture, Massimo Scolari. Uh, we see in the sky um, his trademark um, wings. Uh, I think his, uh, his drawings are, can be called uh, visionary. They're, they're architectural dreams. And, uh, you know, living in a highly mercantile uh, time, 
uh, you know, dreams are encouraged and discouraged. But, 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 I read today preparing this presentation that uh, there was a symposium at, at Yale University, in fact, by the way of an exhibition with the drawings of Massimo Scolari with a, with a question, uh, um, are we still dreaming? Or is dream, are dreams still possible? And, you know, the conclusion of the symposium was that, uh, yes, yes, through drawings, we can dream and the dreams are still possible. But this is not uh, the case everywhere and every time. Anyway, uh, I think if Le Corbusier was right when he said that architecture is not a profession, but a state of mind, then you can serve the spirit of architecture through drawings. You allow your imagination to assert itself as honestly and as skillfully as possible, and you are serving architecture. You work for architecture. You are an architect. You are not an architect if you don't express in any way what you feel, think, about architecture. Some people build, many build. Some do not. But, but even through drawings, I think the spirit of architecture can endure. And uh, it happened uh, in the past. Uh, there are architects who, who uh, position themselves in the history of architecture, even without uh, building a lot. Um, you know, Antonio Santelia. I mean, uh, how many buildings by Boulet do we know of? But his drawings are important uh, presences in the history of architecture. There are also architects who built a lot, like, uh, Frank, uh, like Frank Lloyd Wright or Le Corbusier, but, but they also drew a lot. They also imagined a lot of just imagined architecture. Some good, some maybe less good, but they couldn't renounce to the temptation to, um, you know, do architecture. Without clients, nobody can uh, stop you from doing projects. So Frank Lloyd Wright did Broadacre City, working for almost 20, 10 years when he had fewer commissions at the time. And uh, Le Corbusier worked for Ville Radieuse also for about 10 years. So again, if you love architecture, if you are born to be an architect, if you are in good health, you don't even have to be rich. You just need a pencil and some paper or a mouse and a, and a laptop and uh, you can do architecture. Scolari has his, uh, you know, means, uh, representational means, but you see, this is a watercolor on paper from 1972. The misleading muses. Well, not too many, not too many architects uh, in, would employ such uh, such uh, words. You know, the misleading muses. At Cooper Union in New York, uh, at least when John Haydock was a dean, uh, such a title would have been very possible. But Cooper Union was a spe very special school. This is actually, this is a, a drawing done together with Leon Creer. And it's called, um, uh, and I had it and I, I, I lost it in the final presentation. Anyway, Leon Creer and Massimo Scolari worked on this um, uh, um, uh, watercolor, this drawing. Uh, and uh, it, it has something to do with the Janus, the, the god of beginnings the god that gave name to the first month of the year, January. I don't know, it was called the disappointment of um, Janus or something like this. But an interesting idea to have two architects working on the same uh, artwork or drawing, uh, Leon Creer and uh, Massimo Scolari. Now, are these uh, feasible architectures? Not necessarily, but they, they visualize the dream of architecture. 
They make you think. Now look at this title, Oblique Drawing, A History of Anti-Perspective. I like very much. I'm also an adversary of perspectival drawing. Because I think perspectival drawing in its uh, you know, uh, post-Renaissance uh, version uh, is uh, misleading in the sense that it's too ambitious. It wants to convey a so-called uh, uh, objective representation of reality. But reality is never just objective. So there are so subjective elements, like for example, in the Middle Ages, you know, the perspective was done, uh, okay, it was excessively subjective. For example, if the painter or the draftsperson didn't like uh, his neighbor and his neighbor was right near him, he would depict him very small. And if the painter or the draftsperson laughed a young lady who was very far away, she was drawn very big. So, you know, uh, it's a, about a mental perspective, uh, 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 an emotional perspective. So Massimo Scolari, uh, I don't know exactly, I didn't see this book, I didn't read this book, but I like its title, Oblique Drawing, A History of Anti-Perspective. I think we overestimate perspective. That is, we overestimate control through reason, through objectivity of the seen reality. In essence, it's a method of controlling. You control through, uh, you know, the mechanism, uh, the invention of, of perspective, perspective while drawing, you control a certain view of uh, an entity which is almost object-like, separated from the subject, that is, from you. But uh, it's exactly this aspect of uh, excessive control, objectivist control, which I think is bothering. Anyway, uh, now something he built. He didn't build all those buildings, it's probably in Venice here, but but the wings belong to him. And, and the, you know, the, these wings, uh, sculptural as they are, I think uh, they evoke very well his vision. You know, the, these wings are maybe uh, uh, Icarus wings. You know, they are the wings of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, uh, melting down, the wings of falling back to the earth, the wings of, uh, of um, you know, uh, impossibility in a way. But, but on the other hand, they are the wings of desire. And I think desire is immensely important. And in the absence of desire, you cannot do a good architecture. Kopp uh, Himmelblau and the Gold Freaks, they, uh, approximated uh, a little bit in a different way this desire for the blue skies uh, and the desire for flying and the desire to escape gravity in uh, several of their works, if not all of them, but in one explicitly, uh, a museum of art that they built in Ohio, of all places, in the United States. I like this picture very much because this, these are the wings of, of, of longing, of desire, of uh, aspiring, of aspiration. You aspire towards something. Massimo Scolari. <clears throat> Um, some of some of the of the drawings, some of the artworks he made um, are, uh, you know, uh, closer to painting, to drawing than to architecture. But architecture is still present, like in this um, image that he created. This one is on the cover of a good. Uh, um, good uh, L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, which I have. It's a good drawing by uh, Massimo Scolari, and uh, it made it on the cover of that issue of uh, 
l'architecture d'aujourd'hui published, I don't know, at the end of 60s or early 70s. Massimo Scolari. It's a dream world, yes. But nothing wrong with dreams, we need them. Otherwise, life could be quite uh, tedious. We saw this one already. Uh, you will see a model of uh, this uh, building here. He built it. I hope I have it in this presentation. But I, I wonder what was in his mind when he made this drawing. One thing is for sure, for Massimo Scolari, like for other architects, architecture, the one they aspire towards is poetry. Poetry, uh, you know, externalized through visual means. It has to be poetry. Now, the pragmatician, the mercantile one, would probably protest or say this is not architecture. But in the absence of this architecture that Massimo Scolari drew and draws, what do we have? Because life is not just praxis. A strange being here. I maybe even wonder if, if indeed is uh, wonder if indeed is uh, is by Massimo Scolari, but I took it from a website with his works, and this one from the same one. He drew incessantly. In fact, uh, on his website you can see many other drawings that I don't show here. Are all of these oblique drawings? Maybe to an extent. But obliqueness, like the diagonal, expre ex express uh, you know, opposition, express otherness. And I think we need otherness. That is, we need art. It is the role of art to be other. And this is the model of that drawing that we we saw earlier, quite a big one. Massimo Scolari. Here is uh, again uh, another drawing. Uh, it seems, uh, uh, you know, this obsessed him. It's probably the biblical arc. So the paintings, here is someone who wrote, I think, uh, in a sensitive way about, uh, about uh, Massimo Scolari. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, there is something here that blocks me. It exasperates me. So I cannot read uh, the second line, but I, I can read the others. The paintings and drawings and markets, 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 the models by Massimo Scolari evoke an archaic dream like, now you have to read because I can't, Something is blocking my, my, my text here. Desolate scenes depict views long into the distant nothingness. They speak about Scolari's detached sense of creative freedom and his ability to feel comfortable in that mode of thought. The wings which appear to resemble that of a phoenix may provide that signal to a flight of fantasy or dream. Ruinous buildings and monoliths are scattered through the scenes, at times bombarding or providing strong visual obstacles. This is probably translated from another language. The English is not perfect, but anyway, 
These images recall a time before us, ours. Perhaps where the fortification, for example, where is not written like this, perhaps where the fortification enabled a secret world to exist in each place without distraction or having, succumb having succumbed to a stronger enemy. In this sense, Scolari, Scolari will always sit on the outside without defeat by the forces of the outside. Simon Linardi, Simon Lonardi. Anyway, uh, I don't know who he is. And a few other drawings by Scolari before we talk a little bit about Zaha Hadid because she died on this day, the 31st of March in 2016, that is seven years ago. Herself, a uh, case of obliqueness before she became seduced by fluidity, by total fluidity or fluid totality, to use the two titles of the two books published with the works of her students at the Institute of Architecture in Vienna or in Vienna. But we are still with Massimo Scolari. And I think this is the last image of this short presentation about him. The wings still fight, uh, fighting for the distant horizon, still longing for what is far away. And now let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about Zaha, not that uh, uh, she is not uh, widely talked about, but uh, since this is the day when she died seven years ago, I sort of uh, quickly, uh, uh, rather quickly, make three presentations about her. Let's start with this one. Um, Zaha Hadid, born in 1950 and died in 2016 on March 31st, and today is March 31st. Here she is, here she was, here she will be. Uh, Dame Zaha Mohammad Hadid, uh, she was born in October on the 31st and uh, died uh, on March 31st, was an Iraqi architect, artist, and designer recognized as a major figure in architecture of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Born in Baghdad, Iraq, Hadid studied mathematics as an undergraduate, as an undergraduate and then, but anyway, uh, not in England, and then enrolled at the Architectural Association School of Architecture in 1972. In search of an alternative system to traditional architectural drawing, an influence by suprematism and the Russian avant-garde, Hadid adopted painting as a design tool and abstraction as an investigative principle to reinvestigate the aborted and untested experiments of modernism, to unveil new fields of building. She was described by the Guardian as the queen of the curve, rather simplistically, I would say, who liberated architectural geometry, giving it a whole new expressive identity. Her major works include the London Aquatic, Aquatic Center for the 2012 Olympics, the Broad Art Museum, Rome's Maxi Museum, and the Guangzhou Opera House, uh, and many other works. Some of her awards have been presented posthumously, including the statuette for the 2017 Brit Awards. Several of her buildings were still under construction at the time of her death, including the Daxing International Airport in Beijing and the, the stadium in Qatar, a venue for the 2022 FIFA World Cup. Hadid was the first woman to receive the Pritzker Prize Architecture in 2004. She received the UK's most prestigious architectural award, the Sterling Prize in 2010 and 2011. In 2012, she was made a dame by Elizabeth II, the Queen of England of Great Britain for services to architecture. And in February 2016, the month preceding her death, she became the first woman 
to be individually awarded the Royal Gold Medal from the Royal Institute of British Architects. Quite a professional biography. Some early works, the Peak Leisure Club from 1982, which he won, it was a competition. Not too many students in not too many schools of architecture would have the guts to make an architectural project in this way. But she did and she won. It was not built, but, but it was a step towards stardom and uh, it was auspicious. It was clearly a vision, and the vision won. Yes, it was not built, but the vision won. This was the first, uh, you know, uh, major success for Zaha Hadid. For about 10 years, she struggled. She, uh, you know, worked for competitions. She, did, she didn't have commissions, but... Uh, a creative force of such a magnitude um, cannot easily be stopped. Even now, seven years after she died, she's still living with us through her office, which continues to win competitions and to build. All those over 400 um, employees that she had are still busy working. Uh, thanks to the inspiration that uh, Dame Zaha Hadid uh, uh, gave them. It wasn't just inspiration, it was also the means, the practical means to have that office run. So all these are drawings of uh, submitted for the competition. The one in Hong Kong, the peak. Now, Cardiff Bay Opera House, she also won this competition. It was not built. But she will make up for these, uh, you know, uh, insufficiently, um, you know, honored uh, accomplishments through many, many built works. Too bad this one was not built, and too, too bad uh, um, towards the end of her life she had another disappointment with the, the Olympic Stadium in Tokyo. She won that competition, and like in this case, it was not built. Instead, it was Ken Gokuma who was commissioned, although the competition was won by Zaha Hadid. So these are early works, um, uh, I mean, early works, but you know, they, they were not too long ago, actually. So actually in, in a rather short time, she, she, uh, she built uh, a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of buildings. I mean, you know, very, very, very few architects can compete even in, in terms of the quantity of the works she built. Cardiff Opera House, a competition she won, but again, the building was not built. Incomplete, completed, and a few unbuilt projects. I show lesser known works, uh, 600 Collins Street in Melbourne, Australia. The tower was, uh, I don't know, if incomplete or not built. I didn't see it completed, no. There is flamboyance in, in her works, and sometimes this flamboyance could, uh, you know, agitate uh, more moderate spirits. Melbourne, Australia.
Interesting also that uh, she was a very rebellious uh, architect from the very beginning, from, from the time when she was a student, actually. But towards the end of her life, um, uh, I think um, ornamentation, ornament uh, became uh, uh, more and more explicit. Becoming structure or the structure becoming ornament or ornamental. We see this even the, uh, uh, the lower levels of this uh, tall building proposed for uh, Melbourne, Australia. Mercury House Tower, St. Julian's, Malta. Here we see again, you know, the the, the mechanism, uh, the flowering of the building, the mechanism of, uh, of uh, bringing, uh, uh, you know, the obliqueness uh, uh, or rebellion into some kind of uh, an ornamental um, externalization. I don't know if I found the correct words now, but uh, perhaps you understood that uh, when I contemplate this uh, building by her and I see I see this transition from this part to the other part. It's this um, twisting that uh, she increasingly uh, used in order to uh, enhance uh, the unexpected or the unknown, and, and, and also to, to um, force structure to leave its predictability, usually orthogonal predictability, and become organic even flower-like. So these are works that were not built or incomplete. It is my point of view, my, my yes, my opinion that, uh, but I don't know if I should say it. I, 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 I regret that she didn't work also for uh, uh, those uh, less privileged. And most, all his works, as far as I know, were done for, uh, you know, an elite, the mundane world. I mean, I, what, what do I see here? I see a swimming pool at the last uh, uh, level, the, you know, the highest level of the tower. You know, the, the, this is for an elite. And uh, maybe, 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 I mean, I don't know. We don't know when we die. But maybe if she was closer to the, to the to those uh, you know fishermen that Le Corbusier admired that Le Corbusier said that he wanted to he didn't go to parties he didn't go to uh, you know expensive uh, uh, mundane events he preferred to talk with the fishermen at the edge of the sea uh, and uh, I don't know it's possible that Zaha Hadid paid the price for uh, alienating herself from the um, you know, the lower level, so to speak, of society. I would have liked to see some social housing done by Zaha Hadid, by Dame Zaha Hadid, and I never saw. Uh, and now this is, what is it, in Cagliari, a, a museum? Yes, it's spectacular in, um, you know, in, in its digital representation. It was not built. And this white architecture, it is organic, but it is not raw and it is not earthy. And I read that this was his, her desideratum. This was her desire to build a raw, earthy and vital architecture. Vitality probably is, to an extent at least, but his, her architecture was never raw and never earthy. Even here, all these white surfaces, you know, yes, the curves are um, organic, but, uh, but the materiality is not, and is not an earthy building at all. But yes, they, 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 it's a spectacular architecture. Uh, I regret a little bit that, that it is um, almost obsessed by whiteness. So in terms of forms or form, it is, let's say organic, but in nature, what is organic is never just white and, uh, you know, slick like her architecture is.
But we know her architecture. I mean, many interiors are kind of like this. Uh, what is this? Freedom Square in Nicosia, Cyprus. Um, Now we see the architectural flower right here. Esfera city center in Monterey, Mexico. I mean, again, you know, this is this is an architecture for a certain elite, you know, for, uh, you know, yuppies, for people with money who can afford a lot of glass and perhaps air conditioning. Uh, who afford the sleek architecture and the, you know, the sensuous uh, curves of her buildings. But, but I wish I saw some social housing done by Zaha Hadid and I never saw. Maybe if she lived longer, she would have done them. I hope so. I mean, she built some housing in Milan, but uh, those are also not for the, uh, you know, for those without means. So this is a project in, in Mexico and uh, yes, 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 you know, impressive, but I'm not very impressed. I mean, with all due respect, I'm not very impressed because this is a mundane architecture, is an architecture that turns its back on a lot of other kind of life. And I think this is problematic. Anyway, New Century CTR Center in China. I don't think, I mean, I don't know, but I don't think she worked digitally. I don't think she even knew how to, to work, you know, digitally. She did her sketches manually and then she gave them to her employees, her collaborators, and they developed the scheme. But she appreciated, just like Frank Gehry, very much the highest technology and without it, her buildings would not have uh, would not have come into being. And she is to be appreciated for the fact that she did appreciate, uh, you know, uh, uh, scripting, programming, uh, parametry, and uh, so on. But I don't think she herself worked like this. Dominion Tower in Moscow, Russia. Uh, this was built, actually, and here it is, not very spectacular towards the outside, and the interior is, uh, uh, you know, a Zaha Hadid building. Again, a lot of whiteness, a lot of windows that do not open, and a lot of air conditioning that needs to be used. The interior is, is um, dramatic, uh, almost a little bit uh, neurotical, but the whiteness is still here and is balanced somehow by blackness. But no color, which is uh, which is rather surprising for some from someone who claimed that wanted to do a raw earthy architecture. It is not raw and it is not earthy. But it is, uh, it is inciting and interesting, and especially here where you have the whiteness in a dialectical play with the blackness. But it's slick. It's not raw. Something is missing. The forms might be, let's call, organic, although in this, in this particular building, it's not quite so, but in other works. But organicity does not manifest itself only in terms of, uh, you know, form. Uh, tectonics matter, materiality matter. Yet I like this atrium. It is uh, abstract, it is tensioned, it is. Uh, 
it has conflict, it has, uh, it, it is dynamic. A bridge in New Taipei, Taiwan, um, it was not built. Uh, you know, an impressive uh, bridge. I rush a little bit because, uh, as I said, I have to leave a little bit earlier uh, today, and I, I, I have two other presentations that I would like to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, present to you. Iraqi parliament building in Baghdad. Um, I don't know what to say about it. I'm not reading this text, but um, there were some problems here also, uh, competition and uh, uh, apparently the one who won the competition was not, uh, was not um, uh, commissioned. Uh, it's too bad that um, I don't have other pictures with it. It would have been nice if, if she built something in, uh, in, in, in Iraq. You see at the bottom of the text, the client reserved the right to pick any of the top three and they have gone ahead and done that. In other words, you know, she didn't win. The Qatar Stadium, um, this was uh, done, but with uh, some controversy, which I don't know if she was responsible for that controversy. Uh, recently completed, uh, the one in, 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 in Qatar. If structure becomes ornament and ornament becomes structure, then uh, you know, her later buildings seem to point the way towards it. And we are going to see in the second presentation something relating to this. I, I'm not sure that this uh, ornamental design is, uh, is hers. Uh, I mean, it is part of her project, but it seems to me to be a little bit too, you know, too almost placid uh, for, for uh, what usually uh, expected from her. A gallery of the Science Museum in London, 2016, mathematics, an interesting interior. She loved mathematics and uh, she, she studied mathematics. I don't know exactly what it is. I'm kind of a showroom having to do with uh, the mathematics. I think when there is more color or color in her works is better. But too bad there is too much whiteness in her works, in my opinion. Zaha Hadid Architects carves out sculptural flood protection barrier in Hamburg. It was built. It's this uh, outdoor space, uh, you know, this walkway and, uh, you know, closer to landscape architecture. It is architecture, but not buildings per se. Hamburg. Fifth Avenue, a tower, of course, was not built. 
and the tower it is, but you see again the, the, the presence of ornament, not to say um, decoration. California residence. Is it a residence? It is, but um, or it, it was supposed to be. Uh, she only built one residence, one house, so to speak, for a rich Russian man. Uh, this one was not built. But if I have that project here, I will, uh, I will uh, comment on it, the one in, in Russia. Now, this could have been uh, some other building, some other function. Does it look like a house? I'm, I'm not expecting sloping roofs and a nice sunny veranda. But it's, I, I think it lacks, it lacks intimacy. Middle East Center, St. Anthony's College, Oxford, UK. I like the dialectics between the old building and the new. I like the fact that you see here where we have also a little bit of color and a, a, a different kind of material, you know, it, it's, 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 it's better. But she could have gone further in terms of uh, assuming organicity, not just in terms of form. Dubai Opera House, unbuilt. Reggio, Italy. I don't know exactly what uh, function uh, this building uh, would have had. She did so many projects that we could uh, easily, you know, spend hours just uh, looking at the, the unbuilt works by Zaha Hadi, architects, because she was not alone. She worked with at least 400 people. Her office was a big office. Financial market, of course, what would we do without financial markets and without the uh, great architects who serve the financial markets, often forgetting about those at the periphery. Uh, we have a an avant-garde, and we have a, an arrière-garde. But what about a peri-guard? That is the guard at the periphery, on the sides. In a way, all of them are at the periphery. But we, we still think in a linear way, avant-garde, arrière-garde. But what about peri -guard? I would like to situate myself there, part of the perigard on the sides, if we are to talk about obliqueness. 
if we are to talk about Massimo Scolari, if we are to talk about Claude Parent, the oblique. Tokyo National St Stadium, uh, it, it was a sad uh, occurrence that although she won the competition, it was not built. Instead, Kengo Kuma built uh, another stadium that some claim that is full of virtues in terms of sustainability and echo and so on, but I, I consider it rather mediocre if you allow me so, uh, to say so. I mean, if we compare what Ken Gokuma built with what uh, Kenzo Tange built for the, the Olympics, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, 60 years ago, earlier, uh, we see the difference between the Japan then, the heroic Japan of Kenzo Tange and the, uh, you know, rather uh, unambitious Japan of uh, 2020. And ambitious doesn't mean necessarily modest. I regret this building by, uh, by Zaha Hadid was not built. It should have been built, even more so since she won the competition. She even claimed that uh, Kengo Kuma uh, um, appropriated ideas from her project and I think uh, she even went to the court uh, to, uh, to the Palais de Justice because of it but um, she died not much later. I don't know what happened with that um, you know uh, judicial uh, event. It took immense courage from a woman you know coming from Iraq and, and to arrive at this level of accomplishment. So we, we, we do have to, to, to acknowledge that what she did was uh, remarkable to say the least. This beyond even uh, liking or not liking her work is, is really the, the level of, of, of total dedication of accomplishment, of, uh, you know, I mean, most architects would be happy just to build, um, you know, one building uh, of hers, and she built so many. Anyway, now uh, let me quickly uh, attempt to do a second presentation about her, uh, Zaha Hadid New Works by Zaha Architects, showing, you know, showing uh, the activity that happened uh, after she died. Uh, here he is, Patrick Schumacher, leading the office uh, in her absence, but is she truly absent? I don't think she is. I don't think she, she, she truly left uh, in 2016. Here they are, the two of them. I, I, I learned that actually initially when she hired Patrick Schumacher, uh, she didn't like him. That's what she declared in, a, in, a, in an interview, that she didn't like him. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe not much later, he became indispensable to her. Uh, and uh, so this would say that sometimes at least uh, the first impression is not the correct one. I like this picture uh, with them, you know, the young Patrick Schumacher and still the young Zaha Hadid and with the books behind. And I like the expression on her face and I like his expression. I think they had a very special relationship, um, an unusual one. Some people thought they were romantically involved, but apparently they were not. Um, Probably books are written already about uh, the two of them. Uh, they became celebrities, of course, uh, and um, he's still doing a good job after she went to some other place. The Russian mega smart city. Well, when I see these words mega smart and then in front of them Russian, I, I tremble. Uh, they are, they are uh, waging a mega smart uh, war now in Ukraine, aren't they? Very smart indeed. Tens of thousands of people dead. Countless buildings destroyed. 
there is this mega smart thing. It's very sad. And look at this. I mean, I hope it doesn't get built. And uh, I read that uh, I think uh, Zaha Hadid architects left Russia, you know, the, the, and they were not the only ones. Uh, Foster also did the same thing. Hope Himmelblau didn't do it, but uh, uh, some important architecture offices left, uh, uh, refusing to continue the assignments in Russia. But when I look at this, it really, it really infuriates me. You know, this uh, so-called progressive or pro progressist architecture and compare with images coming from Ukraine. I really hope it will not get built. And I don't even think it's a great project. I think it's too flamboyant and too, uh, you know, uh, I'm a little bit tired now and 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 and, and, uh, and depressed when I when I when I think of that uh, inhuman war. All all wars are inhuman, but this one more than others, maybe more than most. Something in China. Uh, I don't know if it was built. I don't. It's possible. I, I at the time when I made this presentation, it was not. But the presentation was miraculous with a video and so on and uh, but again too much whiteness you know and again organicity is not just about form five Zaha Hadid design projects still to be finished following ar the architect's death Morpheus Hotel was finished in Macau. Sorry, again, this presentation was, was prepared, uh, you know, a few years ago, but it was built, Morpheus Hotel, and it has some qualities. Of course, it's an expensive hotel, a very expensive hotel, but I like the exoskeleton that, you know, where, where ornament becomes structure and structure becomes ornament. It's almost going towards some kind of a, um, I mean, this reappraisal of, of, of ornament is, uh, is uh, obvious and uh, rather unexpected when we look back on the works done by Zaha Hadid when he was inspired by suprematism and uh, Malevich. It is a wow architecture, but maybe it is a little bit too much wow. And when you think of it, you know, of course, beauty should not uh, be, uh, uh, you know, uh, restricted uh, through a moralistic appraisal. But, but I wonder if anyone can enter this hotel at all levels and rent a room. Uh, again, it's a building for an elite. And beauty shouldn't be just for an elite. Although maybe sometimes it is, or often it is. Is it a tortured uh, structure? Well, maybe you can use this word, not everywhere, like here, no, maybe, maybe even here, not. You know, it's, it has to do with the aesthetics that uh, the architects believed in. they would not have been satisfied if this was just a, a prism. They needed to problematize it, and this is the way they chose to problematize it. One thousand museum, that in fact, she died when she was going to Miami to um, inspect probably the, the website, the, the site, um, you know, the construction of this building, which um, is rather rather explicitly, uh, you know, phallic, uh, I don't know. 
again, it's a, it's about an elite, you know, those, uh, the new money, you know, moving in, having balconies where you could have parties with 40, 50 people in these, uh, you know, impressive towers, not just hers, and the one on the left and the one on the right. Of course, it is impressive uh, in certain parts, you see this, uh, you know, uh, baroque uh, concrete uh, structure, but but it's 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 a little bit uh, uh, unsatisfying that yes she tried to to create a, a skyscraper that is or a tower that is a little bit a little different than the others, but in essence is serving the same gods the the gods of uh, going higher and higher the gods of opulence the gods of money the gods of uh, uh, mundanity uh, and uh, as such i don't think it is satisfying it's still a masculinist masculinist building although it was designed by a lady and strangely it is uh, literally masculinist not to not to express myself differently but i did a little bit earlier in a certain way, the other towers, left and right, are uh, less masculine than hers. And I'm almost sure they were designed by men. Anyway, as far as city center, this one, we saw the project, and it was, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I still don't know if it was built or not. I hope it was not. <laughs> But then even Tadawando lost his mind when he built in uh, in Mexico. You know, he did uh, his concrete uh, architecture covered with, uh, you know, with plant material, with the vegetable material. It's terrible. Tadawando, a man of, uh, you know, uh, sober uh, aspirations. Beijing's new international airport, it opened. Uh, here I have uh, I have uh, some pictures with it. It is impressive. Yes, it is impressive. It is big. It is the biggest probably in the world, or I don't know, one of the biggest. But I look at the surface, the walking surface. You know, the the one you walk on, and you wonder how many people need to clean up this, uh, you know, uh, shining uh, uh, large surface in order for the tourists to feel. Uh, that they are ruling the world. Valises, luggages, they didn't know what was to come, COVID. Anyway, reflections, of course, uh, mirrors. The structure is impressive, particularly in the process of building the building. And I hope like here, I, I think the building is more impressive during, during the process of being built then because because at that time it was not white it was not shiny it was not slick yes here and there there are some uh, you know uh, impressive uh, architectural moments but i still like more the building during the construction because at least it's not white and it's not slick I have been in a, in, a, in a building by Zaha Hadi, the library she built in Vienna, in Vienna, in Austria, and uh, it is the same, uh, you know, uh, problematic whiteness, shining whiteness. Uh, the, the, the effort uh, is, is incredible, no? The, the, the constructive effort. Yes, this is what I like. I like this. It should have it should have remained like this. I think. Sorry for the controversial statement. Some kind of an Eiffel Tower that is womb like, like this. To see the engineering, to see how it was made. 
I think it was a mistake to cover it in those sleek white uh, so-called organic uh, curves. Now, it should have remained like this. It would have been much better. Anyway. This is flamboyant architecture, it is. But we see again the presence of ornament, increasingly so. There is a system, but the ornament tries to make it a little bit softer. And whiteness again, too much whiteness. I'm not talking about the clothes of, of these Arabs. No, I'm talking about the architecture. Singapore. I don't know what this is. Uh, it's some kind of um, urban planning. The sound wave concert hall by Zaha Hadid Architects. This was planned for Russia, but I don't know if it will be built. By Russia a little bit because uh, as I said, I have to I have to leave earlier today. Uh, they won the competition, and uh, I don't know what to say. Should should it get built? But before I end this, I want to show this um, um, this um, illustration from a lecture by Patrick Schumacher, where he talks about tectonism and where he identifies various. Uh, uh, kinds of uh, modernism, and he starts with functionalism, and then he considers the considers the two trans transitional styles, postmodernism and deconstructivism, and then various kinds of uh, parametrics: foldism, blobism, swarmism, and tectonism. At the time when I made this presentation, uh, you know, it was, uh, uh, you know. The last phase was tectonism. Maybe in the meantime, he, Patrick Schumacher, arrived at the more uh, recent uh, phase. I don't know. But from uh, uh, tectonism uh, is, in a way, uh, uh, encouraging me to think that what I said about the, the airport in Beijing it was correct, because exactly, it's exactly about this to bring tectonic a reality and force into the buildings. And excessive whiteness and sleekness, I think, um, uh, is detrimental to um, a more tectonic, um, you know, uh, genuineness, reality of the buildings. And I end by uh, this second presentation by uh, uh, quoting him, Patrick Schumacher, ornament and structure are not separate. And I would agree with him. Ornament and structure are not separate. Ornament and structure are not separate. I actually think I have se several slides with the same message. Ornament and structure are not separate. And now very, very quickly, I will make the third presentation about Zaha Hadid, which is not a long one, but I, I, I do have to do it. Um, I think, I don't know. Not sure. Is this one? No. Just a second, please. Now, this one I think we saw. I'm a little bit confused because ah, this one we saw, and I think this is the last one. Yes. So, very quickly, uh, an ad memoir about her but with some uh, original interventions, so to speak, from me, Zaha Hadid and the sub-aquatic creatures, because I think there is a relationship, or there was, or there could be a re relationship about the uh, sub-aquatic creatures or the sub-aquatic life and her architecture. And here I show images uh, of just that. Except that here there is no whiteness. 
Well, there is some aggressivity too sometimes in current architecture. There are curves, there is total fluidity, fluid totality, all underwater. Nature was and is and will be sublime. That is if we don't uh, kill it. Although we are trying hard to, to kill it. An artist, I don't know exactly why I in included her in this presentation about Zaha Hadid, maybe in relation with the magical underwater creatures. This artist, Valerie Bruce, uh, twists and turns paper into magical underwater creatures not quite related to Zaha Hadid's um, architecture. Now, Zaha Hadid drawings, I already show some, but here I show others. Um, not too many architects, of course, do, do this kind of artworks or quests for um, architecture through this kind of uh, images. I like these drawings. This is a manual drawing by her. Because here there is some viscerality. You see the emotion of the hand and through the hand, you know, the heart and the mind. The peak, we talked about it. And the structure that, uh, you know, I, I, I wish it was more externalized than it usually was. A life in projects, the Opus building in Dubai, which was built. Sky Soho. She has a vast, vast of Zaha unveiled senior skyscraper for Australia's Gold Coast was not built. They were not built. Montpellier Archive and Library. The one in Qatar was built, and we saw it now unveiled as a trio of blossoming residential towers in, on Brisbane Riverfront, Australia. Hong Kong Polytechnic University Jockey Club Innovation Tower. I like this, uh, this work by, by uh, Zaha Hadid Architects. I consider it one of the best by them leaning as it is, but still strongly anchored in the earth. This is uh, an art gallery in London, but it was not built. But I salute the fact that at least in the project is not white. And I think it would have looked even better if the, the older buildings, the existing buildings were, you know, uh, shown as they really are. That is not simplified uh, grayness and so on. City of Dreams Hotel Tower in Macau was built. We saw it. The question is, how's dreams? Everybody? Everybody's dreams? I'm not sure. I don't think so. 
Contemporary Art Museum. Um, we saw this project was not built. Apartment buildings in Milano. And I think if I remember correctly, she was the developer also. So in a way she built these buildings for herself or for her company. Uh, I hope I'm not wrong. If I am wrong, I, I apologize. They were built, but again, these buildings are for a certain segment of society. The same segment of society she always serves. Milan, Italy, Zaha Hadid Architects. At least here there is wood. That's good, I think both outside and inside, but you can only imagine the price of one of these apartments. Immense apartments, no? One apartment per floor, it seems. Incredible. When so many people don't have a home. Uh, this, uh, I show also a few things which like, you know, uh, she designed also, um, you know, shoes and, uh, and, uh, and uh, bags and so on. She even had a, a department or a, an office, uh, um, you know, there, there were certain people, uh, several people in her office who, who did just that, you know, shoes for Lady Gaga. Um, she looks sad. And I... I think her sadness was probably caused by, by the fact that she lost contact with the lower base, with the base of society, with those fishermen Le Corbusier talked about. Maybe her solitude, her loneliness, and I do believe she was lonely, was caused in part by that. She was too much involved with an elite, with a patient people with the mundanity and from what I know somebody told me who was invited to her apartment and I hope I have the correct information it seems she didn't have a kitchen in her apartment otherwise luxurious vast apartment in London this I think says something when an apartment doesn't have a kitchen I think she was very alone I mean, she loves here, but she had immense success. But I think deep down, she was very alone. I also see, say, see if I'm allowed to say it, a little girl in her. And I think that little girl was actually the, the one who was, uh, you know, uh, continuously uh, uh, creative. You have to have a child in you in order to be so creative as she was. I regret we lost her.
I am sure she was able to be furious. If I remember correctly, when I saw the retrospective of her work at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, there was a video, uh, an interview with her, and my memory tells me, again, if I'm wrong, I apologize, but my memory tells me that I saw her firing one of her employees right there during the interview. A uh, man, a blonde man came to her and uh, whispered something into her ear and she fired him right there while she was interviewed. This is what I remember. But memory sometimes is uh, not be, to be uh, totally trusted. So, But this is what I remember. And yet I believe she had a good heart. She had to have a good heart. I, otherwise you cannot do art really, or architecture in this way. It's impossible. But she was probably also a difficult person, sometimes as, as important artists usually are. Anyway, beyond all that is her work, which continues to stir us up. We have to confess. And we see behind, you know, a fragment of her beloved uh, constructivist Russian works. Was it by Malevich? I don't know. Maybe. And why do I show him here? I don't know why. <laughs> Uh, you know, Daniel Ipskid. Imperfect as they were, I made this presentation as an homage to Zaha Hadid. If I express maybe some controversial um, opinions, I believe in what I said, but I could be wrong as well. But all in all, my presentations were an homage to her. It might be that this is a scene from the, you know, uh, starting the construction for the building 1000 uh, in, in Miami. Uh, one time, 1000 Museum in Miami. And I think here she is in that uh, house built for the Russian man. Uh, but I could be wrong. Elegant, as always. And lonely, I, I, I'm tempted to think. Despite uh, so many people around her. I think she was fundamentally alone. Although she had uh, her protective angel, uh, Patrick, Patrick Schumacher, who does a great job at, at continuing what she started. Very young, perhaps a student at the Architectural Association when Alvin Boyarsky was the dean or the director of the school. A proud woman, very proud. And here is Boris Johnson. Why do I show him? I don't know. It happened that he was uh, in the presentation when I when I uh, when I created it a few years ago. You can you can see the little girl in her on her face. She had the young spirit. That little girl was responsible for her best works. I hope I have a picture here because I, I did find a picture with her as a little girl, but I don't know if I have it in this, in this presentation, but I like her expression here. Here she is with uh, Rem Kolkas, young and restless, both. At AA in London, Dame Zaha Hadid. I see women, the world, 
over a smart, gifted and strong, with a talent and commitment to transform lives. I would agree. Architecture is really about well-being. On the one hand, it's about shelter, but it's also about pleasure. Well, Peter Eisenman might disagree. I started out trying to create buildings that would sparkle like isolated jewels. Now I want them to connect to form a new kind of landscape, to flow together with contemporary cities and the lives of their people. There are 360 degrees, so why stick to one? Good question, Zaha. Here she is with uh, another man who questions the validity of one single angle, and that is Frank Gehry. And here she is with uh, friends, uh, Peter Cook, uh, Jan um, Kapriki, and uh, Sir Norman Foster, and Amanda Levete, and two other people I don't know of. And here she is with I don't know who. And here she is receiving honors. And here she is I don't know where. And this is a picture of the, the exhibition she created for uh, Malevich and Suprematism. She did a design. And here she is again. And we can only be sorry that she died. Thank you for being here today. Thank you.